All right, and um, thank you again, Manuel, for inviting me to come and talk to you all. Um, and evidence-based medicine, obviously, we all think it's a good thing, uh, but one of its big flaws is that it's very hard to come up with pictures to illustrate slides on talks like this. So on my um, welcome slide here, I've got just part of the home page of the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Association. Right. Uh, I always think we should have conflict of interest declarations in anything to do with evidence-based veterinary medicine. I don't have any. Um, I'm not paid to be a director of the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Organization. That's a, uh, a voluntary thing. I, I am paid to be a, a clinical director of a vet practice, though. And you've probably all come across the, the definition of uh, evidence-based medicine uh, shown up the top here. Um, I can use my little laser pointer, hopefully, to illustrate it. Uh, so evidence-based practice involves applying the best and most relevant scientific evidence integrated with clinical expertise and taking account of what the animal and the owner need when making clinical decisions. So uh, when we're talking about evidence and the quality of evidence, I think mostly what we're talking about is scientific or research evidence. Obviously, usually that's published in one way or another, uh, and it is directly clinically relevant in a way that could change what we do in practice. Uh, what it isn't is clinical expertise, even though clinical expertise does involve quite a bit of evidence of itself. Obviously, much expertise, clinical expertise, it isn't evidence or knowledge, it, it's skills and aptitudes. Um, but clinical expertise does involve knowledge that we get from everyday practice. And it also involves all that huge amount of background knowledge we have in physiology and endocrinology and pathology and surgery. Um, and much of that is based on evidence, isn't it? It's based on research, but it's not really counted as evidence when we talk about evidence-based veterinary medicine. Uh, so when we are talking about evidence, we're talking about fairly new scientific research, but, but probably means over within the last 10 years or so, that could potentially change or provide additional support for what vets are currently doing in practice. And that kind of evidence can be divided into two types. There's what you might call mechanistic research. So that's the sort of basic and applied in vitro and in vivo research and some epidemiology that really tells us about how and why diseases affect bodies and how and why treatments affect the diseases and bodies. And that's separate from what you might call clinical research, which is a very specific subset of epidemiology that quantifies the safety and efficacy of treatments and other interventions on populations of patients with a disease or, or possibly on populations at risk of a disease, if you're testing a vaccine, maybe. And the me mechanistic research, that tells us what can work uh, and how and why it works. And that is definitely a large part of clinical expertise, that knowledge. And I would say that most of it belongs in the, the blue circle of this Venn diagram here. But some of the newer stuff probably go in the best research evidence in yellow. Uh, whereas clinical research, that tells us what actually does or doesn't work and quantifies how well it works. So it, and that guides clinical expertise. It even overrides it sometimes because somebody will do a randomised controlled trial showing that what we all think is right actually doesn't work at all. And those findings most certainly belong in that yellow circle of this Venn diagram here. <clears throat> Another way you can think about it is that the mechanistic research drives science-based medicine from within because science-based medicine is the application of um, evidence of that sort of research in medicine. Whereas clinical research it's not part of science-based medicine at all, really. It doesn't tell us how diseases work and how treatments work, but it can tell us how well they work. It's, it is basically a method for assessing how well science-based medicine does work. And you've probably all seen something like this evidence pyramid. There are all sorts of different versions of it. Um, and in that pyramid, the sort of basic and applied mechanistic research is put in the lowest tier of evidence. It's hardly evidence at all in evidence-based medicine. Um, and what we really normally talk about when we're 
discussing evidence is the clinical research, uh, which improves in quality from clinical trials through cohort studies and case control studies and, uh, sorry, improved evidence, I should go up my list there, from case reports through case control studies, cohort studies to clinical trials with randomized control trials being thought to be the best. Um, but we, when we say that the quality of the evidence varies, it's actually varying in two ways. One of, the one of those ways is by the category of the study design, and that's what improves as we go up the pyramid. But also each study can be done well or poorly, and that's a different way of assessing quality. And I'm just going to talk about those two different types of quality, starting with the type of study design. Um, and as, just as an illustration here, there's, there's um, two studies done by the same group, run by Gruen there, and they use trazodone, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, as a calming agent for dogs having sort of cage rest and similar after orthopedic surgeries. And they, they did a study published in 2014. They call it a prospective open label trial. Basically, that means it was a case series. And they gave trazodone to owners of 36 dogs, didn't try to have any placebo groups or control groups. And they did some measures before and after the surgery. And basically, the owners all thought the trazodone was very effective in calming the dogs. Uh, but then the same group later on did a randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled trial. Uh, they did a power calculation to determine their group sizes on the basis of the um, effective size in the first study. And when they did that, the owners still thought the trazodone was very effective, but they thought the placebo was equally effective. In other words, the trazodone wasn't really doing anything at all. And that illustrates why you have to do the right sort of study. And when we're talking about the way the quality varies with study type as you move up the, period, the um, pyramid, um, what we're really talking about is improved attribution of causation, of being able to show that the treatment really does what we think it does and also a more accurate assessment of the effect size. The studies allow those things to be determined. And those are the things we really want to know if we want to know our treatments or our preventive, like things like vaccines, are actually working and how well they are working. But obviously it requires the studies to be, each individual study to be done well. But that doesn't mean the lower down the pyramid studies, the observational studies, such as cohort studies and case control studies, aren't valuable. Often they are um, cross-sectional studies, which are often survey types of studies. Uh, they are very good for determining prevalences of diseases or prevalence of side effect, and they can indicate risk factors that are associated with disease occurrence, but they can't tell us if they cause disease occurrence. And the case control and cohort studies can tell us all sorts of things about um, the relationship between exposures and outcomes, such as something going on in the environment and diseases, for instance. And cohort studies are generally better at that than case control studies, but you can often do a case control studies where a cohort study would be impractical. But with all of these observational studies, we have to be very careful because they tell us about associations and associations are often not the same as causal factors. And, and many vets seem not to understand that very well. And this is a, a version of that well-known statement that correlation is not necessarily the same as causation. So study types higher up the evidence pyramid provide more reliable evidence than those lower down because of their design features. Uh, and those features reduce random chance effects, which we know as noise, and they reduce systematic biases. And for primary research, what's called unfiltered information here, that's this layer of studies in the plot here, you know, the sorts of tricks that are included are control groups included and statistical analyses, being a prospective rather than a retrospective study, being an experimental rather than an observational study, randomization and blinding of one form or another where either the experimenters and or the patient or the owners don't know what's, which is the control and which isn't. And then there's an additional layer which gives you even better control, which is where the primary research can be appraised by experts and also multiple studies of the same thing can be combined. So in the primary research, randomized control trials are the best method to establish whether interventions work, but they are purely a quantitative thing. They don't tell us anything about the mechanism of action. Ideally, for a 
a treatment, we like to know that it works from things like randomized trials, but we also like to know that there is a, a really good mechanism of action that's been demonstrated. That the filtered information, what we call evidence synthesis perhaps, um, the lowest layer of that is where we have a, an expert or more, one or more experts who review the papers and who have knowledge of things like experimental design and statistics, as well as the clinical field, whether it's dermatology or medicine or whatever. Uh, and peer review done by journals should be like that, but unfortunately many veterinary peer reviewers are not very familiar with experimental design and, and with statistics. So it often isn't, unfortunately, um, but you can have effectively post peer review which is post-publication peer review, which is what critically appraised articles are. Um, the next layer up is what we call a critically appraised topics, um, where a particular question is asked and all the evidence found and appraised. And as you may know, the Center for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine produces some of these. They call them best bets for vets. And RCBS Knowledge also um, published knowledge summaries, particularly in the journal Veterinary Evidence. And these are based on a very standardized question uh, called a PICO, P-I-C-O question for uh, effectively asked for a particular population does an intervention when compared to a comparison affect the outcome. So for instance, for cats with feline urinary, lower urinary tract disease does prednisolone when compared to meloxicam improve clinical signs. That would be a, a, an example. And the key thing about uh, these critically appraised topics is that all relevant studies should be searched for and there's instructions for how you search the literature to do that. And they should all be assessed in a certain type of way to come up with a conclusion about what the evidence says. And systematic reviews typically regarded as the very highest level of, of um, data or evidence uh, are, are a, a step up on that again. And they're distinct from the sort of typical review that vets read, which is known as a, a narrative review that you see in journals and CPD journals and textbooks. And, and narrative reviews vary greatly in quality because the authors are free to say almost whatever they want to say, which to some extent is fair enough because they're experts, but they, they can have their own ideas and their own agendas sometimes, and they can cherry pick, as we call it, the literature, to pick at the, the, what supports their view. And that's why narrative reviews actually belong in that very lowest level of the pyramid down there under expert opinion. And a systematic review is designed to remove that variability and that, that freedom to use opinion in, in these reviews. So again, when a systematic review is done, the authors should be following very precise guidelines. So there are some published. Uh, so for instance, by the Cochrane Collaboration and by this one called Prisma. And again, all evidence has to be found using very specified search criteria, looking through literature databases such as CAB International and PubMed. And those studies have to be critically evaluated using a very specific methodology and the results reported using a specific methodology. So that removes biases from narrative reviews in sort of a similar analogous way to how a randomized controlled trial removes biases from say case controlled studies. But again the, the value of a, a systematic review depends on how well it's done and many many published systematic reviews are not done at all well. They don't follow the guidelines and I've even read reviews published in veterinary journals that are entitled systematic reviews but they simply are not. And meta-analyses are simply a way of combining data from similar studies of the same top topic, and that allows an improvement of the precision of the effect size. Uh, but again, they, their quality depends on rigor, and to be honest, some of those are purely marketing exercises by drug companies. Uh, a, a kind of evidence that's not mentioned in the evidence pyramid are what are known as expert consensus statements, and some of you will have seen some from uh, the International Society of Companion Element Infectious Diseases and the American Veterinary Medical Association, the European Advisory Board on Cat Diseases, such like. And they typically are, are useful where there's not enough evidence to do a systematic review. And often they will address individual questions in a topic and recommend, uh, make recommendations. And they grade the evidence or the recommendations 
on the basis of how much evidence there is and how reliable that evidence appears to be. Uh, again, as always, how good they are depends on how well the process is done. Um, so uh, I've been asked to talk about why evidence is poor. Well, one reason, obviously, is there's not very much of it compared to human in veterinary field compared to humans. And that obviously comes down to there being relatively little funding. And that's a societal issue that uh, we vets can't do a great deal about. So there's low numbers of trained research scientists in the veterinary field. And most vets working in practice have little interest in doing research, which is fair enough because obviously they're, they're vets, they're supposed to be treating animals. And the evidence, as I've already said, can be poor in quality because a large proportion of all the studies done are low down the evidence pyramid type. So we don't have very many randomized controlled trials or systematic reviews in veterinary medicine. It is improving, but there's still not many. And the reason the lower down the evidence studies are done is because they're quick and easy in general, much easier to do than a, a randomized controlled trial. And because there's little funding and vets have little time to do research, they tend to go for the easier studies. But then we also have to move on to the second reason why evidence quality can be poor. Uh, and that is that their design and the way they're carried out and the statistical analysis and the reporting can be poor. And that happens because vets are not trained scientists and because research is actually very difficult to do well. Vets are just simply not trained to do that well. And many of the studies that are done outside of, say, drug companies are done by, for instance, residents in training or specialists in practice or, or maybe vets who need to publish a paper as part of doing a certificate or such like a, a postgraduate qualification of some sort. And a lot of those vets, they're interested in their field and they're very knowledgeable, but they're often not particularly interested in research methods and statistics in and of themselves. Again, they tend to do the easier studies, but they often don't even appreciate why the scientific part of it, the, the research methodology side of things, and the statistics is so important in determining the reliability of the evidence they produce. And the honest truth is that many academic vets in universities also have a very poor understanding of these things. And as I said, that tends to result in studies being done with you know, severe flaws in their design and in their analysis and in their reporting. And I'm going to show you a set of lists. I'm not going to go through them in any great detail. Um, obviously, you can look back at the talk if you want to pick out um, some of the things I've mentioned. I'm just showing you some of the flaws that happen. For instance, many studies have a control group that's not very well matched to the treatment group. Um, often studies don't specify the outcomes to be analysed in advance, which is actually necessary to meet the uh, assumptions underlying the statistics that are used. Often outcomes are subjective and that can make uh, measuring them very uh, difficult so to, accurately. They often don't do complete randomization or don't show in the paper how they've done it. So you don't, the reader doesn't know that the randomization is complete or not. Often the blinding isn't complete or, or the way in which the animals were put into um, different groups, allocation concealment, as they call it, is, is not complete. A very, very common one is that group sizes are too small. So there's not enough statistical power to detect an effect. So you don't know whether the, the result you see is false negative or not, uh, if it's negative. Uh, they don't specify what to do about animals that drop out of the study. And those are just in the design before the study's done. There are also flaws in the data analysis and in the reporting. A key one is actually not saying exactly in the paper what's been done. So the reader doesn't really know what, how the study was done. Uh, often the outcomes that were specified in advance sometimes aren't reported. Sometimes they don't account for missing data. And sometimes outcomes that were not specified in advance are reported. And that's sometimes the result of authors doing lots and lots of statistical tests on subgroups in their data and reporting anything that has a value of less than p equals 0.05, um, which is uh, not a statistically valid thing to do unless you've specified in advance what you were expecting to find. So if they just get reported, 
um, and it's not stated that that's how that those results were found, the reader is left thinking there's a, there's a statistically significant result there which may not actually be the case. Uh, often you see papers that report p-values but don't tell you what the actual effect size is, so you don't know whether it's clinically significant. And it's not at all uncommon to find papers, they do a study, get a result, but they overinterpret the results. And I've read papers where the abstract actually says completely the opposite of what the data says in the paper. And even the evidence syntheses, the systematic reviews and such like, have um, major flaws as well. So a, a paper from last year by Utley et al, um, they did a systematic review of the flaws in systematic reviews in human medicine. They, they actually identified 67 different flaws, but they include things like insufficient literature searching. So the, the um, authors of the reviews are just not finding all the studies out there, and they might even be, again, somewhat cherry-picking the research they want to include in their study. Uh, and for instance, they're supposed to state if they don't exclude a, um, a study in their, a, a, a published trial in their systematic review, it's supposed to be given a, a reason for that is given, and sometimes that's not. There are valid reasons for excluding them, but often they're not stated. Uh, some of them are done with just a single reviewer, and really you should have two or more, so there's double checking going on. Some of them find all the papers, but take them at face value. They don't actually quality assess the study. And authors are supposed to um, state conflicts of interest, and sometimes they're not disclosed, or, or the funding source. So there's many, many different types of um, problems. As I say, it's difficult to do this sort of research because uh, there are many possible causes of problems. Uh, and that leads me on to what we could call deliberately misleading research. So far I've been talking as if all these flaws are accidental from not knowing how to do research properly, and obviously that is a, a very common thing unfortunately in veterinary medicine. But if you know what you're doing, you can use the same flaws to produce misleading research findings. And that is done by people with a conflict of interest or some other form of agenda. So drug companies um, certainly do do this sometimes. Obviously, they do very good research sometimes as well. But you'll all be familiar with what's known as the, the funding effect or sponsorship bias, where uh, research done by companies on their drug or their treatment tends to be more positive than research done on the same drug by independent researchers. And Cigarette companies tend to find that cigarettes are less harmful for health than independent researchers, for instance. But there's also ideological or political um, causes for misleading research. So uh, certainly there's, there's evidence that the Chinese government is, uh, as it were, interfering in, say, acupuncture research coming out of China. It's uh, more positive than is realistic. Uh, homeopaths, um, a lot of their research is dodgy in this sort of way. And in the UK, we've had some very um, <laughs> poor research done um, by people who are very convinced that cats and dogs should be eating vegan diets, uh, and also by people who think badgers shouldn't be culled to prevent TB in cattle. And whether or not it's good for dogs to have vegan diets or cattle to be culled, um, certainly the science shouldn't be messed with to try and prove it one way or the other. The science should be done uh, in, you know, with, without an agenda. And the, the use of um, these flaws in a different way to be misleading, uh, sometimes that's a conscious, very strategic um, action. Uh, and there are companies that will do this stuff. If, you, if you've got enough money, you can pay companies to uh, employ these techniques to get, try and give you the results you want. And that's not in any way illegal. That's not a fraud, unfortunately. If you make up the data from scratch, it's fraud. Uh, but there are many, many published papers that use these techniques. Uh, but a lot of the time, um, the, the flaws arise for cultural factors. So within organisations or groups, um, everybody shares the same view and they don't see some of the biases they have and they end up being incorporated into the research they do. Um, and here's some of the uh, tricks that you can use um, to produce deliberately misleading research to give findings more like the findings you would like to happen than may be real. Obviously one type is to use the study type most likely to give you the desired answer. A, a simple one is if you run a survey, ask leading questions. But even in clinical trials, even in randomised control trials, you can mess about with the control group and the treatment group so that you're actually asking a slightly different one question to the question you claim to be asking. 
You, you can use biased populations. You can use two small groups if you don't want to find an effect. Maybe you're comparing your drug to a, a, a new drug to a competitor group, so you want to do one of these non-inferiority trials. You can make you can get the result you want just by low statistical power. You can not have complete blinding or complete randomization. Um, you can mess about in all sorts of ways with the statistics. And obviously, only publish the studies that give you the favourable results, not the not studies that don't agree with your viewpoint. And don't disclose your conflicts of interest. But even if you do absolutely very, very good, technically excellent studies, and drug companies often do, you can still mislead with those studies. So, for instance, you could do a very technically excellent study of your drug against a drug that you already know to be inferior. Or you can use too low a dose of the drug you're comparing to, or too high a dose of the drug you're comparing to if you want to make your drug seem less toxic. And you can do things like define different or in advance, but not in the publication, decide on different endpoints in the trial and only publish the results that come from favorable endpoints. In effect, you can stop the trial when it's looking positive, but not run it any longer in case it becomes negative later on. And you can do multi-center trials in lots of vet schools, but only publish the results that come out positive, not from the centers where the results are negative. Um, so there's many, many ways in which uh, it's possible to mislead with excellent trials, and one of them is to use relative rather than absolute data, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. And if you have a lot of funding, obviously a lot of these companies and industries do, uh, you can influence results even more, obviously, even before you do the research, you can fund only studies likely to be, that you think might be favorable, but not unfavorable. And that's often done for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And you can fund research that sort of muddies the waters and confuses things, or decoy research. Uh, and the tobacco industry did a lot of that in their attempts to prevent regulation of, of tobacco in the sort of 50s to 70s. Um, and you can set up your own journals. They're called vanity journals. And then you've got very friendly editors and friendly peer reviewers. It makes it easy to publish your research. Um, so I'm just going to give one example uh, of misleading research. And I chose this partly because it was done by a, a big um, company um, and partly because they had a research consultant among the authors, but also because I know this afternoon you're going to be talking about osteoarthritis. Uh, and this is um, the randomized controlled trial that was done to support the use of the drug Gali Galiprant, the product Galiprant so the active ingredient being Grapiprant, as an analgesic for osteoarthritis. And it was done by Aratana Therapeutics. They developed the drug, although they were then bought out by Elanco, who supplied the drug now. And the authors of this study, three of them were employed by Aratana Therapeutics, and one, as I said, was a paid research consultant by them. And it was a very good study. They had 131 dogs in a treatment and a placebo group that sets good sizes. And they used a, a well-validated questionnaire called the Canine Brief Pain Inventory, to collect two different types of pain scores uh, on day zero and then on days 7, 14, 21 and 28 after the treatment. So the trial was designed well, but in this paper, which is supposed to provide evidence about whether an analgesic is effective or not, they actually do not give any pain scores at all. It's actually quite unbelievable when you read the paper. Um, what I mean is they don't give the absolute values of the pain scores. There's no means, no standard deviations, anything like that. All the data are presented as changes from day zero pain scores. But unfortunately, they don't give the day zero pain scores. So there is no way for you and I as readers to know whether the baseline pain was in the same two groups. So we can't interpret the differences between the groups. And we've got the two different pain scores here. Uh, we don't have any day zero data, as I said. All we have is changes at day seven to day 28 from day zero. Uh, so it certainly looks here like the Grappiprant data is a better decrease in pain score than the control group. But for instance, if the control group started off a little bit lower in pain than the Grappiprant group, maybe as it declined over the, the weeks, it bottomed out and ran into zero day scores, so it couldn't decrease anymore. That would make it look like the control group had less of a decline than the placebo group. Or it could be the other way round. 
maybe the um, maybe the grappy prank group itself started off with lower pain scores uh, and in that case the same level of decline as in the control would look like a bigger relative effect so we have no way of knowing whether these data are showing us genuine declines or not and the statistical analysis was also done on the relative scores so the statistics is is not necessarily telling us that there's a real pain score in summary you can read the whole of this study that was done in order to get um, this drug marketed and sold without knowing whether it's an effective analgesic or not and you know maybe it is an effective analgesic but you have to ask yourself if it is why didn't the authors provide the absolute pain scores so i see this piece of research as being highly misleading now um so so far i've explained how veterinary research evidence is poor all the flaws in the in, in types of studies and the fact that we do lots of or veterinary research consists of lot lower down the pyramid study types rather than randomized controlled trials and i've explained that the flaws can be accidental or deliberate and I've given some reasons why research is poor. It's a lack of funding, at least outside the pharmaceutical industry, conflicts of interest. Some veterinary research is done by people just wanting a very quick paper. Uh, so they tend to do those lower down the pyramid studies and they often make errors because they don't really know about research and statistics, research design and statistics. But there's more of a problem than that uh, because we've got to ask ourselves why the poor quality research is published in the first place. Uh, if, obviously, if the journals didn't publish, it, it wouldn't happen. But unfortunately, in veterinary medicine, even in what we would call, regardless, very good journals, many of the editors and many of the peer reviewers, obviously, they, they may well know their clinical field well, but they don't know much about research design and statistics. So they don't recognize the flaws in the primary research or in the evidence syntheses. Um, and most of the vets reading those journals also don't recognize the flaws and as a result poor quality research has just become a largely unrecognized and unquestioned norm in veterinary medicine even worse than that there are what are known as predatory journals i'm sure you will have heard of them who will basically publish almost anything for money so they're not concerned about quality and then there's the problem of things like vanity journals set up by drug companies or similarly captured journals which have been effectively taken over financially by drug companies uh, which exists to some extent to publish research that supports the view of the, the people who run the journal. And even after publication, there are further problems. Um, the evidence is published as primary research or evidence syntheses. Um, and some vets do read research papers, um, but how many of them read the methods and results sections carefully or understand them if they do? Many vets, I know, they, they read the abstract and take it at face value. And primary research evidence, usually the vast majority of the evidence that gets to vets in practice, isn't a result of the vets reading the primary, reading the published papers. It comes to them indirectly by all sorts of routes, which we can refer to as knowledge transfer or knowledge translation. And in that process, the evidence can be further distorted. Uh, so here's a list of the sorts of ways that evidence does get to vets via published papers, obviously, systematic reviews, expert guidelines, but there are narrative reviews in journals and textbooks, uh, specialty conferences like this one and dedicated veterinary group forums, uh, more general veterinary social media groups, uh, such as on VIN or for instance in, in the UK we've got a big one called Veterinary Voices with thousands upon thousands of vet members they often discuss clinical cases um, organizations such as Vet Lexicon uh, clinical decision support tools so there's Vet Bites you may have heard of or Plums Pro and then that huge continuing professional development or continuing professional education industry producing conferences and webinars and courses and journals articles in the veterinary press and then, of course, via drug companies, via, via the industry, uh, some of which is by independent advisory bodies. A, a well-known one is the European Scientific Council for Companion Animal Parasites. It refers to itself very much as an independent body advising on um, cat and dog parasitology. But actually, it's entirely funded by the major um, parasiticide manufacturers and by IDEX. 
Uh, and then obviously there's industry reps at, at drug conferences or coming to your practices and, and telling you about stuff and their promotional literature. And obviously advertising, include advertorials. So, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> and many of these routes of knowledge transfer in, involve intermediaries with their own um, abilities and deficiencies in regard to the assessing and interpreting the evidence and with some conflict of interest in many of those cases. So what is happening to the evidence during these knowledge transfer processes? Some of it might be misinterpreted or distorted or there's spin or omissions or additions, some of which are, won't be intentional, but some may be. So we have I've sort of summarized the process in this diagram here. So up there at the top, we have the evidence as published in uh, studies, much of which can be poor because the studies might be done poorly. Uh, and some of that goes to vets who might not understand the flaws in the research. There's evidence synthesis, some of which is poor, and again, may be read by vets, some who don't understand the flaws in evidence synthesis. Uh, but most of the evidence goes via these knowledge transfer routes that we've just been talking about, where it may be adjusted again, where it comes to vets who may not be aware of uh, modifications in that process, intentional or otherwise, before they use it. Uh, to improve the quality of um, the evidence available, we want more higher up the pyramid studies, clinical trials rather than observational studies, but that requires funding. Uh, a, a useful thing is to have trial registries. These are quite common in, in human medicine, where the clinical trial design is all registered in advance, sometimes even published at, published at the design stage in advance. And that means when it's done, and carried out, it can't be messed about with and the statistics fiddled with while the study's on the go. Uh, there is no veterinary trial registry, unfortunately. We did have a go at setting one up a few years ago, but it, it never took off. Uh, for vets with limited experience of research, it would be helpful if when the studies are ethically reviewed, which most are these days, if that included review of the research design and statistics. And that is something that does happen often in human medicine on the grounds that it's really unethical to spend funds for research and time for research on a study that's not going to produce worthwhile data because it's poor quality. And two of the large veterinary corporate groups, maybe others have as well, have actually employed experienced academics to be head of clinical research so they can advise vets within their groups who might be doing research in practice. But the main thing is for vets doing research to collaborate with scientists and statisticians in advance of starting their study. And another thing that would be very useful and is actually a very easy thing to do is to use available guidelines. So if you look at something called the Equator Network, which you can just Google, it has um, guidance for each of different study types on how to report the study. And from that, it implies how to do the study. So for instance, Consort shows how to do a randomized controlled trial. Strobe is for observational studies, agrees for more basic science studies, and for systematic reviews and such like, there is um, Prisma and Cochrane. <coughs> it would hugely improve research quality if vets doing research actually utilize those, those guidelines. We need to improve publishing. Journal editors need to have more knowledge and advice about research design and statistics. And it would also help if those journals also required um, studies to apply to the published guidelines and so they could reject more poor quality research. It would be good if peer reviewers knew about research design and statistics. That's difficult because there are just not very many peer reviewers, unfortunately. 
Uh, and there are other problems, obviously. It's very difficult, as, as I've written down here, uh, to address some of the problems with drug company funding of journals, that uh, drug companies have a, a quite a lot of influence over, not the open access journals, but the, the, um, uh, the standard type of journal, uh, because they provide a lot of advertising income, and predatory journals and captured journals are not going to be very keen on um, uh, some of the things I've been talking about here. And obviously vets in practice, they don't need to be trained to be researchers, but they do need some skills themselves to assess the quality of available evidence. And one of the important things is just to raise awareness of the problems I've been talking about in this talk among general practice vets and the benefits of practicing evidence-based med medicine. And, and that is a lot of what the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Association is trying to do. And we would like vets to be taught to think about where that information is coming from. Uh, what source is it? Is it from a, a CPD journal? Is it from a drug company? Uh, they need to, taught to be able to find primary research evidence and literature searching is actually very easy these days. They need to understand the reliability of the evidence that arises from different study types, randomized controlled trials versus case reports and case controlled studies, and also from uh, systematic reviews versus narrative reviews. And ideally, they really need to be able to criti critically read research papers themselves. And again, there are published guidelines on how to do that that are very easy for individuals to use. GRADE, for instance, is a, a, a freely available, easy to use such system. But there are various checklists that you can tick things off as you read through a study. But vets need to be taught to do this. It would be good if they were taught that as part of the veterinary curriculum. Uh, so, and if evidence-based medicine skills are part of licensing examinations, in the UK that is sort of coming about because basic evidence-based veterinary medicine skills are part of day one competencies expected of new graduates. Uh, but it also needs to be incorporated into regulators' expectations of veterinary professional behaviour. So evidence-based veterinary medicine skills are not a requirement, for instance, of the RCVS's code of conduct for veterinary surgeons in the UK. In the US, the, the equivalent, the principles of veterinary medical ethics are currently being updated. And it does look like they might include evidence-based veterinary medicine skills in that. And the Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Association is actively lobbying them to do so at the moment. But the truth is, general practice vets will never have the time to be able to assess all the evidence they need in real time, as it were, because the evidence is constantly changing. So what's really needed is point of care clinical decision support tools, things that you can look at in a, contact, in, in a, in a, um, a consult and see a simple answer to a simple question. And these things are available in many situations in human medicine. Obviously, they need to be quick and easy to access to use them during consults. They need to be demonstrably highly, demonstrably highly evidence based. And there are some available now, some in development. Well, the one I know about most is VetBite, because that's been developed in association with the British Small Animal Veterinary Association in the UK, but there are several others available. Uh, and, but even despite those, vets would still need to have a basic understanding of evidence-based veterinary medicine skills, how to appraise papers and such like, when using those tools, and sometimes they'd still have to get information from other sources. But the information in the decision support tools would be produced by members of the profession who do have evidence-based veterinary medicine expertise, so not, not general practitioners uh, who don't have such skills. And hopefully, maybe, one day, the, there will be a recognised evidence-based veterinary medicine specialisation, uh, maybe even a college of evidence-based veterinary medicine, and we have been talking in the Evidence-Based veterinary, Based veterinary Medicine Association about how we might make that happen, not any time soon, I'm sure. And if you do have an interest in the sorts of things I've been talking about um, today, consider joining the EBVMA. We have a dis forum to discuss these things. We carry out research and education and advocacy projects around evidence-based veterinary medicine. We have some educational materials and such like. And we would like to increase our membership and continue to build up EBVM skills so we can continue to advocate for evidence-based medicine and improve evidence and also counter misinformation and disinformation in the profession. And with that, I say thank you very much for listening.